there's a lot of intentional anti-intellectual thought online, and a lot of it has been spurred on by this meme. It separates authorial intent and interpretive analysis, and uses an example of a section of a story stating that the curtains are blue. The English teacher might think that the curtains represent, you know, the character's immense depression and lack of will to carry on, but really, what the author meant is the curtains are blue. Well, we can't say that bad word yet because we're not even a minute into the video, but this meme has become so unbelievably widespread that even in your average conversation about a series, someone might drop just, you know, the casual, oh, the curtains are blue. It's the media discussion equivalent of, it's not that deep, bro. And that is its entire purpose. It serves as an ego stroke for those who lack the ability to understand a subtext. Ironically, in an attempt to put people down for looking for subtext, the creator of the meme is also drawing upon their own interpretation of the English teacher that they created in their head. Clearly, the author didn't intend for something to be said with the curtains being blue, but let us ask a certain question. Why was it mentioned to begin with? Was it to paint a picture of the surroundings? Why would that be done? Perhaps to describe a general tone? There are massive fundamental issues with disavowing interpretive analysis and only following authorial intent, but first, I want to break down the two circles on this meme. Starting with... Starting with doing your own interpretation. Art is basically a massive collection of human experiences. This is Bartol. So naturally, they are going to be chock full of what people would say are the author's ideas, and of course, that's true to some extent, but something fundamental we can't ignore is that for every human that makes a piece of art, there is also a human experiencing that art, who projects their own experiences onto that experience to create a whole new experience, fundamentally, so that I can use the word experience six times in a row. I went ahead and I created this generation's Mona Lisa. I will present this without comment, and you might already have some ideas in your head about what's going on here. And to further extrapolate on the coming point, I sent this to three of my Diamond members without any additional information, and I simply asked them to do one thing. Tell me what you think is being communicated through this piece. I didn't tell them my ideas when working on it. I didn't lead them in any direction. I simply handed it to them and told them to interpret it. The first person, Gyro, said that the man on the bench does not look content with life. <laughs> uh, assuming him to be straight-faced. He imagined that he wouldn't be there if he didn't have to be, as if he's just going through the motions of life and it's grueling. Also, who the fuck builds a bus stop without a cover? He looks like he's going to and from work, and he would attribute that as the root of multiple of the reasons he thinks that he looks so sad. The second person, Caper, immediately noticed this rainy day atmosphere, and that there is no terminal to shield him while he waits for the bus, noting a theme of classism or how public transport is not given proper funding or care. He also interprets his face to be a slight smirk, as if they remained willingly complicit of this gloomy situation. He then notes the signs here, um, a commentary on how road-centric he assumes America to be. That gray line might just be the world's smallest sidewalk, something that would hammer home the road-centric point. He also points out that the signs are on both sides of the man, as if it is suffocating him. He believes that the piece is bringing attention to how much love bikes get, uh, whereas people who take public transportation are left behind, and people accept it as if nothing needs improvement. The third person I said this to, Ozzy, notices just about the same things as Caper. Um, he, however, also incorporates similar things to Gyro in relation to the transportation system in the US screwing over the workers. Uh, just like everyone else, he also points out the lack of a bus terminal over the bus stop to protect you from the elements. Uh, Ozzy and Caper, however, do not have the same complicit argument to it. The important part is that I picked these three people because they all have life experiences from different parts of the world. They would have all grown up and had different lived experiences, experiencing different cultures, politics, interpersonal relationships, different formative memories, different religious upbringings, and much more. And they all delivered. Gyro's take on this was an anti-capitalist leaning, dreading of the feeling of the 9-to-5 grind, wasting your life away, and I'm going to psychoanalyze for a second, but it's something that likely comes from his own personal life, um... Own personal life familiarity. I'm gonna spoil the fun here now. Uh, Caper Nazi, we're almost 100% of the money. 
I quickly made this wonderful piece while thinking about the frustration of living in a metropolitan area of the United States, having to cross massive strodes to get to where I'm going, and while our public infrastructure continually gets defunded or underutilized. I take the bus to and from work, and there's no bus cover, most of the time the bus is late, and so on and so forth. The share of the road sign was not a ribbing of bikers, like Caper implied. It was more of a comment on how drivers are told to accommodate bikers because bikers aren't given their place to ride and, due to that, are oftentimes victims of automobile accidents. Uh, I think this distinction between the people I picked is important because Gyro, who mainly focused on the anti-capitalist angle, is from the United States. Whereas the other two people I picked were not, and could immediately recognize the absurdity of the road situation. Something Caper pointed out that was not intentional, is the feeling of suffocation from these two signs. I did not place these thinking that it would feel suffocating for a writer. I just sort of I just sort of drew them. But upon closer inspection, I can totally see how that interpretation would come to be. Now, because Caper and Ozzy were closer to my intent, does it make any other interpretations wrong? Well, why would it? Without this follow-up video, my intent wouldn't have been known to begin with. In an instance like that, how do you prove intent? I've come out now and told you my intent about the piece, but what if I was lying? What if I'm not actually being honest about what I was thinking while making this piece? What if my intent changed over time? Does that make the earlier, allegedly correct, interpretations retroactively incorrect? When you read a story, you don't have the voice of the author speaking into your brain like an omnipresent god. Uh, the fact that I can tell you what I was thinking when I made this piece usually doesn't happen. You are imagining the world you have been dropped into, the situations the characters are in, the way the characters look, their expressions they may make, and sure, the author may have left some flags along the way to help shape the image that we perceive, but ultimately the things you will imagine will speak to you on a personal level. And when you release a piece of art to the world, as mentioned prior, thousands, if not millions, of people from all walks of life will be putting their own observations out there. Let's take a quick look at what Vince Gilligan had to say about a question about one of the most popular television series in the world, Breaking Bad, when he was asked why Walter White made the mistake that led to his downfall. It caught. That's a fine question that uh, even my, my six excellent writers and I uh, tend to disagree on. Uh, I personally, first of all, I think it's up to, I think anyone who has an opinion on it has as valid an opinion as I do. Uh, and I'm not just passing the buck when I say that. This, this show is yours at this point as much as it is ours, uh, and you own it as much as we do. Death of the Author was an essay written by the French literary critic Roland Barthes in 1967, likely one of the most influential essays in terms of how we view literary criticism in modern times. It opens up with an extremely important question. Who is the voice of the text? Is it the inner monologue of the protagonist? Is it perhaps another character's point of view? Is it the author themselves? Is it universal wisdom or romantic psychology? It will always be impossible to know, for the good reason that all writing is itself this special voice, consisting of several indiscernible voices. He speaks of literature as, quote, that neuter, that composite, that oblique into which every subject escapes, the trap where all identity is lost, beginning with the very identity of the body that writes. In an effort to remove the authority an author might have over their own text, he taps into the unknowability of the author, and doesn't actually refer to them as an author, but as a scripter. Continuing on about how that detachment occurs, the voice loses its origin, and the author enters their own death. Barthes argues that the moment text hits a page, or paint hits a canvas, the disconnect between the author and the scripter occurs, because the origin of the text is not an author, but language itself. It's almost as if when an artist creates, they are twisting culture and experiences into language. Quote, Linguistically, the author is never more than the man who writes, just as I is no more than the man who says I. Language knows a subject, not a person, and this subject, devoid outside of the very utterance which defines it, suffices to make language work, that is, to exhaust it. He is in no way the subject of which his book is the predicate, and every text is eternally written here and now. The point of death of the author is that a text's unity is not found in its origin, but in its destination. Art is your own. However, that doesn't mean that the author's interpretation should be ignored entirely. When we're analyzing subtext or trying to come up with interpretations, what we are doing is not attempting to find the golden interpretation but to find a possible one. And at the end of the day, 
The curtains can both represent the depressive state of the main character, or absolutely nothing, depending on how much backing your argument has, and the author's intent or life background is merely one of the many ways to look at a piece of text. You could argue that the curtains being blue was representative of the main character's desire to become a Diamond member for Asratha HS's YouTube channel, but you might have a hard time backing that up. Generally in art, everything exists for a reason, and it's always going to be charged with some even minor message or political thought. A common counter-argument I see online is, well, what if I go and I make an art piece where I just splatter everything on the canvas because apparently everything is considered art these days. You know, what if I just add a bunch of random shit to it? And surprise, you have just created art with meaning. You created a satirical piece that is criticizing the state of current day art. And of course, people could utilize Death of the Author to find an interpretation of your art, even without that information. But again, it's just an interpretation, not THE interpretation. So, why are the curtains blue? Who knows, man. Fill in the blanks, read between the lines, glean information from the tone, the characters involved, the prior scenes, take into account the author's circumstances, maybe things they said about it. All of these things are valid ways to approach art, and showing off your lack of intellectual curiosity and self-reflection by saying, it's not that deep, is not the own you think it is. Not everything needs to be painstakingly and explicitly spelled out to the reader. If it walks like a duck, and sounds like a duck, it's not a duck, because it doesn't have duck written on it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the funny YouTube algorithm. You can also become a YouTube member, which gives you access to behind-the-scenes content, a badge on comments and livestream chats, as well as the use of emotes and videos before their actual release. You can also check the description for socials like Twitter, where I'm objectively correct all the time, and Discord, where we talk about ReZero, My Hero Academia, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. That's about it, though. Thank you for watching. See ya.